So it's June 28th, and I'm sitting with, uh, or sorry, I'm sitting in the MCC at the Deepen Bunker with Janet Puttycomb, uh, and it's just after 11 a.m. Uh, so just to start out, Janet, why don't you talk a little bit about what your job was here at the bunker? I was a communicator. I was a tele-op, and I worked uh, OSACs, which was like a main data switch, mm -hmm. and I worked the message center, and I worked FCC, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and when did you, when were you in Carp? I was from 81 to 87. Okay, okay. And did you live here at the bunker or off-site? I lived in the basin in Uplands. you know, practice for the war, where we'd stay here for days until the exercise was called off. And we had, we were going live on a system at one point. Um, we had, it was called New Day Exercise. And I think I was here for a week without, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because you wake up, You know, during our little practice wars, it was always a bunch of girls. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have separate quarters at that point? Yes. Yes, our quarters were on the three hundred level, and I think the male quarters were on the one hundred level. Oh, okay. The guys, yeah, the guys stayed like well away from us. And were the guys allowed up to see no. you? No. 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 Like I mean. Yeah, but I mean, the women's quarters, we had our bedrooms, you know, the bathrooms, the showers, we're all in that wing. Whereas the men, they were down on the 100 level. Their their big bathroom was up on the, up here on 400 level. And so they had a lot more walking. Um, so you're sitting in the MCC, what was there anywhere in the bunker that you weren't allowed to go or places that you were allowed to go and other people weren't? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, there was, I don't think there was anywhere I was restricted. Um, I could go anywhere. But that's because of where I worked. So, uh, like, there was many, many places in here that were restricted uh, to a lot of people. But um, I, I went, I was, if you worked in the message center, then there was, you know, a bunch of places in the hole that they were responsible to change crypto or whatever. And, you know, if you worked in OSACs, OSACs was the most uh, restricted area. And that's where I worked most of the time, was in there. And FCC was not really a restricted area, but um, no, I don't think there was anywhere in Carp I couldn't go. Oh, um. When you first started working at the bunker, you first got your posting, what were your first thoughts about working underground in the office? Where have they sent me to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was very different when I first got here, especially coming from Ottawa. I was like, oh my God, this is so far away. And underground, I, you know what, when I came here, I didn't even think I realized it was underground until I actually got here. And it was like coming through the airlock was oh boy, where am I going? Like I felt like I was walking into a big freezer or something. And uh, yeah, it was very, very different. It was kind of scary at first, right? I mean, there's all people walking around. And of course, it was my first posting. So, you know, everybody was like knew each other and I felt really like an outsider because everybody was so close in here. You know, everybody knew everybody. And when you first come in, yeah, you really feel like the odd man out. Mm -hmm. But it, that quickly changes.
Yeah. You know, because everybody was, I guess because it was such a, it's, it's a small place to work that everybody was really friendly because if you weren't, if somebody was, you know, notorious problem, then that spreads. Yeah. So yeah, everybody was really good here. Mm -hmm. Like there was never any Peyton place. Oh, I, we, we don't like this person or, he, you know, that one's a, yeah. And you get that in a lot of work areas, but we never did here. Yeah. Not when I was here anyways. What about the, the rank system? Was that strongly adhered to in CARP? Or, um, um, well, it was, there was definitely, you know, the cafeteria, the, the, the officers and the senior NCOs ate over there during the day. And um, everybody else ate over the other side. But at night for the shift workers, we all ate together. Really? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, because if we didn't, then, you know, you'd have one person there. I think everybody loved the fact that it was an all ranks mess. Mm -hmm. You don't see that very often. Yeah. Um, at that point, were there townspeople who also used the mess? At the mess, yes. There was actually quite a few uh, members of the mess that belonged to the town. They had nothing to do with the whole itself. But, you know, that was the only bar kind of thing, place to serve alcohol at the time. probably burnt it down. If I went, because I was working day shift and my shift was over, a shift worker never gets off early. Okay. The day workers, you know, they would get off Friday afternoon, they would get off at two o'clock. And yeah, that doesn't happen to shift workers <laughs> because we had to have somebody relieve us. And nobody's going to, you know, well, I think I'll go out to CARP two hours early just to relieve those guys so they can go to the mass. Yeah, that's never going to happen. So we never got off early, which meant we always missed. Uh, the Friday afternoons at the mess, mm -hmm. but the day workers were always there. Mm -hmm. um, could you maybe talk about what a typical sort of day? Well, you know, we'd get here. The doors were always closed, like the the front, the airlock, and we'd have the MPs would see you on the camera and um, open the outer door, and you'd come into the airlock room. And I've actually been forgotten in there where the MP was sidetracked and like, oh! <laughs> waving in the camera. And it's like, I think I spent about 15 minutes in there. And it was like, I think I was sitting on the floor by the time he noticed I was, you know, remembered I was still in there. And um, so, I mean, that happened, every, you know, to people every now and then. And then the MPs would just get sidetracked or whatever, because it took a few minutes for the doors to open and close, right? So. Yeah, that wasn't too pleasant. I was late for work, and it's not my fault, though. <laughs> that I couldn't couldn't help. <laughs> but yeah, we would go through the airlock. You you couldn't take your pass home, so you'd have, you'd get your pass from the from the MPs. And where I worked, everywhere I worked, we had to we had one of those um, uh, coded things, and you put your hand inside it, and you, 
because so nobody could see you, you punching the numbers. So you would put your hand inside it and do your do the code to get in. And of course, every now and then they'd change the code. You couldn't get in and you'd be banging on the door half the night. And But uh, yeah, meals were in the cafeteria. And you know what? It was the best mess I had ever eaten in. The food was always good. It was always hot. And if you didn't like what was on the menu, they'd make you something else. Uh, I think a lot of people got spoiled by the meals here. It was the best mess I'd ever eaten in. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was really good. And I don't think anybody ever complained about the food uh, in the mess hall, like the, the one downstairs. Um, they always had lots of choices, and the coffee was pretty crappy. But especially one day, oh my God, it was so gross. I started drinking coffee when I got posted here, and I, now, like I, uh, I absolutely yeah, a coffee holic. And one day I saw the, how they make the coffee, and I was like, oh, I don't ever want to drink that stuff again. It's a big bag of sludge, of liquid sludge. I'm not kidding either. Like they'd open the machine, and I saw them do it, and I was like, I'm never drinking coffee again in, in my entire life. It was a bag. I, that's what it looked like. It looked like sludge. And they put it in the machine, and that mixes with water and dumps in your cup. And it's like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm drinking this. Like, I, I never had another coffee here again. Like, it was so disgusting. Was like, I'm drinking sludge. Oh, yuck. <laughs> um, what about uh, the other people who were working in the bunker? Did you make a lot of friends? Here? Oh, yes. Yeah, and, I, and you know what? I had... I got posted out of here like more than 20 years ago, and I'm still friends with a whole bunch of people I knew here. And a lot of them, are they all know I'm coming here today, and they're all jealous. Mm -hmm. And I bought them some keychains and postcards from the gift shop to send to them and say, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> yeah, they were all wishing me luck and, you know, tell me how it went. And, yeah, I'm still friends with all, a whole bunch of people that I knew from here. And then we're, most of us are out now. Well, actually, I think we're all out. Uh, but yeah, I'm in contact with at least 10, 15 people that I knew here. Yeah. Oh, I made a lot of friends here. A lot of friends. That was my first posting. I was here for a long time. And as a matter of fact, do you know what a DA is? It, it stands for Distribution Authority, but you know, this desk would be on a DA. That would be, everything is on a DA. And let's say your DA, you would have to account for everything. Like before you, if there was an audit or before you left here, you know, and to never come back, you had to account for every desk, every, somebody would come and check to make sure, you know, you're not missing a typewriter or, or something. And they were, somebody used to tease me if I was here any longer, they were going to put me on someone's DA. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, I, like you had a lot of friends, but do you, would you say that's characteristic of everyone? Oh, yes. Atmosphere? Yes. Good yeah. Atmosphere. Very good atmosphere. Because it was small, everybody was friendly and everybody knew each other. And, um, you know, the, we had a ball team and we had a hockey team. And so there was a lot of friendship that carried on after work uh, from here. Like I know um, when I was working in OSAX, uh, I was on the A shift and in we got along so well, we used to call each other the A-Team, you know, from, there used to be a show way back when called the A-Team, and we always saw each other after work. Uh, a lot of times, well, at least once a month, we would get together and go for a big dinner somewhere, and or go to somebody's house, and we'd have like a little party, and because we just got along so well together, and uh, like we would support each other through anything. So yes, there was a lot of friendships that carried on after work yeah. from here. Yeah. With, I'm with everybody. Mm -hmm. What kinds of was there any um, official mm -hmm. social events hosted at the maybe not in the bunker, but not in the bunker. Well, in the bunker, yes, uh, we had mess dinners. Um, actually, like you'd always have the Christmas mess dinner where the youngest female became the, the, the you always had the youngest female and the youngest male. And the youngest person would be the CO for the day, and the second youngest person would be the SWO for the day. And um, 
So, and all the officers and senior NCOs would serve at the Christmas dinner, and all the junior NCOs would eat. And uh, and they had some other mess dinners too for all ranks. They also had them for um, officers and senior NCOs. And I actually served at one for the officers and senior NCOs. And you know they would do all their eating and, and stuff. And then they would start with the, the music. And it would always there would always be a, a band there from Ottawa uh, from the from the military band, and they would play all the. Um, the songs from the different commands, like, you know, administrative command, uh, communication command. They would go through all the songs and everything. And so it was, yeah, I only did it once. Uh, it was pretty neat, but that would be the only function that was held in here. Other than that, they were at the mess. And at the mess, you know, there was the Winter Carnival every year. That was always fun. Um, I actually came to a function at the mess uh, before I got posted here, I was on training in Ottawa, and uh, some friends of mine were, uh, were like, "Well, we're going out because they were posted here, and they're like, we're going out to the mass." There was, I think, it was a country and western dance, and I was like, "Okay." And there was a big bus that went around Ottawa, picked everybody up, and uh, little did I know, a year later, I'd be working here, <laughs> and I'm still in contact with people that were at that party. Uh, I haven't heard about this winter carnival before. What's oh, we did it every year. Every year. As a matter of fact, I have a button from the winter carnival. I could send. I can send you guys uh, the the button. I designed it. <laughs> um, yeah, every year they broke up into four teams. Like the whole whole like everybody who worked here was broken up into four teams, and this included the anybody who was a member of the mess, and we would play all kinds of. Stupid sports, um, you know, three-legged race in the snow. A three-legged race. We'd have an ice carving uh, contest, uh, which you know, we're not talking what you see in in Ottawa. <laughs> we had no idea what we were doing, <laughs> but it was usually um, four days long. I think it was four days long. It was a lot of fun. Like we had a ball, and the whole. Day, the work days that this was going on, everybody was wearing their color, like their team colors. And because you would work a little, go over, you would sign up for different races. So you would work a little, oh, I got to go do the three legged race, and you'd run over to the mess and do it. It was a lot of fun. And we used to also do for, I forgot about that because I even ran it one day, one year <laughs> for her winter carnival. I don't know whose idea this was. We used to light a torch at Parliament Hill, and we would run relays all the way up to here. From Parliament Hill? Yeah, and I ran it one year and uh, with a kerosene torch. Oh, my God, the thing stunk. <laughs> yeah, we, we did it all the way from Parliament Hill. I thought I was going to die. Like, I don't know how I got sucked into that. And the next morning, like, I mean, you know, we ran it up to here, and it was the start of the uh, of the carnival. And everything was good. I went home that night, and the next morning when my alarm went off, I thought I was going to die. Every muscle in my body had seized. I could hardly move, and I was like, what have I done? <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of running. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Was there a particular reason why you guys did that? I have no idea, but like they were doing it when I first came here, and one year somebody asked me if I would run uh, with it, and I'm like, um, oh, okay, but yeah, it's a lot of running. You didn't run the whole way; it was a relay, but you ended up you ran two mile stretches, um, and yeah, it's a lot of running. There was about maybe five of us, and we each ran. A, you know, two mile stretches over and over again. It was like, yeah. Oh my God, it hurt so much the next day. It was unbelievable. I thought I was going to die, and I thought, I am never doing that again. <laughs> what a crazy idea. Um, Especially with the kerosene torch, and with it, it was a, like, it was something somebody made, and there was a rag hanging out of it, and inside was some kerosene, and it was lit. It was, oh God, it smelled bad. And they were trying to run with this thing. Yeah, it was nasty. <laughs> Oh. Um, do you mind telling Auntie the story about the, the pills and the glaucoma? The, oh, my God. 
in in the summertime, the whole the 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 tunnel was very very wet with condensa condensation, and often you would come down there at night. You know, I was a shift worker, so sometimes we were coming in there at midnight, and there was actually rain in the tunnel from the condensation falling, and and almost every night you would walk down and you could see millions of toads like little tiny toads, and you couldn't help but stepping on them. They were everywhere. And it's, it's like I know a couple of us actually slipped on them, but they would be all stuck to the bottom of your boots, and, and they were so disgusting. Like, But you, you had no choice but to step on them because they were everywhere. Like there was nowhere you could step where there wasn't these little teeny weeny, and they were only about an inch long. They were just tiny, but they were everywhere. And I, I, I'm guessing it's because of the condensation in the tunnel. That was what they were what they were attracted to, and it was it was disgusting. Like you, you tried not to look down, because if you look down, because you know the, the whole angles a little bit, and you can you can actually see further down. You could see these things hopping all over the place, and you knew you were going to be stepping on. Oh, they were, it was nasty. It was and one year was really bad because I believe this whole area was like infested with toads. There was toads everywhere. Pardon me? Inside of the bunker? No, 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 not inside, no. But, I mean, the whole, out, like, you know, Carp, Ottawa, there was toads everywhere. And, and one year, it was just like, there was not a square inch that there wasn't a toad. Yeah, they were, it was pretty nasty. Because <laughs> oh. you knew you were killing them, right? You knew you were stepping on them. You had no choice. There was nowhere to step. Yeah, it was, it was nasty. Oh, my goodness. Um... Did you find working in CARP, um, what was the ratio of, of men to women and what was the sort of relation between? Um, men to women, I, I mean, there was more men definitely than there was women. Um, ex particularly OSACs was um, mostly com research and some tele-ops. And at the time when I was there, com research was an all-male trade. So like... I only, I, wherever I worked in CARP, I was only, I was always the only female, right? There was, I think when I was in, in Ozarks, I think there was only like th maybe three females. We had five shifts and I think there might've been three females, but never, you would, you would never get two females on one shift. There just wasn't enough, right? There was, there was only a couple of us. So they yeah, have much more males than there was females. And, but yeah, everybody got along perfect, like males, females, there was no, no big, a lot of people ended up married too. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, there was never any problems between the males and the females here. Not, not that I knew of anyway. Mm -hmm. And like I said, even a couple of them ended up married. Yeah. yeah. But you were comfortable working with. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and there was some couples that got posted here married. And uh, so for them, it was probably great because they were in very close relations. Like they wasn't like, you know, you worked on this side of Ottawa and, you you know, your spouse worked on the other side. You both came to the same place. So for them, it would have been neat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, these questions are, yeah, this is the second section of questions. So, um because this was your first posting, I assume you came from home for a while? Or? Um, well, I, I, like I went through BASIC okay. uh, in Cornwallis, and then I came to Ottawa for some on-the-job training. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Kingston for my formal training, and from there I came here. Okay. Yeah. So when you uh, told your family you had your first posting, what kinds of things did you tell them about the bunker? And well, I, I don't think I've really told them anything until the whole um, Denis Lorty thing happened. My At the time, my brother was president of a, what do you, I don't know what you call it, of a frat house. Of a, he was in McGill. And I guess they once a month they would have a big dinner all together. And it, w it was then somehow the, 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 the topic of, what happened at the Quebec Assembly with Denis Lorte came up and people were saying, 
Yeah, people that work underground all the time, they're, you know, there must be a psychological problem and uh, the change of air, constant air pressure changes and stuff. Anyways, my brother stood up and said, well, you know, my sister works there <laughs> and she's not nuts. <laughs> he might say I'm nuts now, but he was very defensive about the whole thing. These were people, you know, making a judgment about us that worked here. I didn't even know anybody who worked here. And he got very de defensive about the whole thing. And he like, he didn't like the idea of, of people just assuming because one guy went nuts that it was because he was working underground. Because I don't think it was. I think it was more of his political beliefs than it was because I mean, it's just a building underground, you know, so we don't have windows. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> But, my, yeah, my family was okay with it until the whole Denis Lorty thing happened. And then they were still okay with it. They were just very defensive about me being here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things were you allowed to tell them about what you did? After I didn't tell them anything. No, we couldn't talk about what we did. You know, we could tell them, yeah, we have a cafeteria or, you know, we did this. the winter, winter. But what we actually did didn't go past our work door. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we didn't talk about it. Like I had a roommate and she was posted here. She was an admin clerk and she didn't even know what I did. And I'm still in contact with her. Yeah. <laughs> her and her husband were here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm still in contact with both of them. Did you, oh, did you know Denis when, yep. when he was working here? Yeah, he worked in supply. Um, do you know uh, that movie, Some of All Fears? Okay, you know when Morgan Freeman is walking down here? You know, you, it's the ply, it's down deep. You have to access it by the kitchen. Uh, he worked down there, which is where all the weapons and stuff were there. <clears throat> it, yeah, so he had... No problem getting weapons out of there. Yeah, it was a, not a good time for carp. The, the morale, a lot of people were subpoenaed for things, you know, Denis had said uh, politically, they ended up having to go to court and, and saying, yes, they heard him say this, or they heard him say that. Um, so it wasn't a really good time around here. Uh, the morale did drop, but it came back. You know, it's, when it was all over, it came back. I mean, there was nothing anybody in here could have done uh, to avoid what he had, you know, what happened, what he had, what he did. But it still, it still weighed on a lot of people's minds. Like, he was a really nice person. You know, he always had a smile for everybody. He, I remember one day he had slammed his fingers in something, and his fingers are all mangled. And he still, we were all having lunch, and he still stopped by the table. It was, hi, yeah, I got to go to the hospital. And he'd look at my hand, and, you know, he was very friendly. So I think a lot of people around here, when they were subpoenaed, they felt really bad because they had to go and talk about him, you know, in court, this sort of thing. But what he did was awful, right? So, yeah, he had to be held accountable for it. I mean, absolutely. I mean, there was something that had to be wrong with him to do that. Yeah. yeah. That's tough. Um, at the time when you were working here in the bunker, did you think about the reasons why the bunker had been built initially? And did people think about the idea of nuclear? Oh, sure. We used to always laugh if, because uh, I mean, this was built a, a long time ago. And you know, weapons get bigger and stronger and better. And we used to laugh like, oh, yeah, if carp got hit, <laughs> we'd never survive it. You know, we'd get out because, I mean, even if you survived it, when you got out, there would be nothing there. So it was always like, well, would you rather be outside when it hit or inside when it hit? And I think most of us chose outside because there'd be nothing left, right? And, uh, but yeah, we always had the exercises every now and then. We'd all get called out in the middle of the night, you know, and have to make our way in and pretend there was a big war going on. And you know what? I think a lot of people would go nuts if this was full to capacity with, you know, the military, the, the, the government. It would be a very, very crowded place. And I think a lot of people would go nuts. Like, I don't think it would work.
Like, I really don't think it would work. I mean, you have three tier bunk beds. Um, and the idea was 12 hour shifts. So, you know, in, in, in one bedroom, there was nine beds, which would house 18 people, right? Could you, can you imagine how crowded that would be? No space whatsoever to do that months and months on end. If people would start killing each other. You know, I don't, I personally don't think it would work. You know, you don't have any privacy whatsoever. You don't see the outside there and then there's just people everywhere. No, because I think the house is like 500 people in here, like to sleep. Yeah, it's not big enough for 500 people for months and months on end. I, I don't think so anyway. No, I think we were like, most people who were here had fun, right? And you never thought about stuff like that. You know, I, I, I can't even think of any, I mean, there was always the fear of fire uh, because it's very contained in here. Uh, that's, you know, why the metal dust and stuff were, you know, just that, that's one of the old dust. But, and we were all fire trained. Um, but fears? No, I don't think there was any ever, ever any fears in here. Uh, not at all. We never really thought anything would happen or uh, anything like that. I think people just really enjoyed being here. Everybody I know that was posted here, they all say it was their best posting. Definitely the most different. No, not a whole lot, um, but I was very young, uh, so listening to the news wasn't really my thing. I don't even think I had a TV back then, uh, so it was, you know, radio and going to the mass, <laughs> but no, no, not a whole lot of stuff. Um, I know at one point, uh, though, my brother, uh, he, my brother's a reporter for CBC, and I know he was planning on going to Russia, and I was like, oh, I wonder if that's going to do anything to me. And yeah, that's gonna say I, they were told I was told if he goes to Russia my, my clearance will be suspended until he gets back. And I was like, Oh, okay, but he didn't go, so it was no big deal. My goodness. <laughs> but no, I mean, I didn't even know most of the news. There was the Falkland War happened while I was here. You know, we would I heard a lot about that. But as far as communism and everything, yeah. No, didn't hear a whole bunch. don't think I ever thought about it. Like, like I said, I was pretty young. And although there are bunkers across Canada, I believe this is the second biggest bunker. Um, uh, no, uh, the one in North Bay being the bigger one. But uh, so yes, I mean, Canada, you know, was somewhat prepared for it. To house the entire uh, uh, government in here? I don't know. And there was all kinds of rumors that you know, like I know we have a helicopter landing pad, but there was always rumors that there's actually secret tunnels from Parliament Hill to Carp, and uh, so nobody ever confirmed or denied. So who knows? Maybe there is, uh, maybe there's not. But there was always rumors that there was secret tunnels for for Parliament to get here underground. I mean, that'd be a hell of a long tunnel. <laughs> like, really? Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of toads. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I don't think there's a tunnel, but yeah, you never know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, can you imagine building a tunnel that long? That would be a lot of work. Yeah, and who'd want to drive that? <laughs> yeah, I think no, I don't think it is that there is. But I mean, you know, you would think there would be, you know, some kind of warning that something would happen, and they all get out here 
uh, in time before the door shuts. Because once the door shuts, it doesn't open. But there is escape hatches if you just got to get out. Like if there's a big fire, there is, uh, I think there's four, four or six escape hatches. I've never been in one, but apparently it's like bug wallpaper in there. Yeah, I'm never going through one. <laughs> but there was, we had one exercise where they said they, uh, all non-essential personnel had to go through um, the escape hatches. Yeah, I'm glad I was a essential personnel. <laughs> Because I hear it was pretty gross. Because, well, no, at that, the time that that happened, nobody had ever gone through the escape hatches. They were there, but nobody had ever gone through them. So, ooh, yeah, I don't think I would enjoy that too much. Yeah. Also, it never happens again. You know, like, um, yeah, so, like, so we don't go that way again. Or it's not really us, we were more like, you know, Russia, uh, Germany, uh, all that stuff. Like, I really hate war. And, and, and so you remember what happened? I mean, all the bad things that happened during that, and like, yeah, it never happened again. People asking the kids, they have to know about it, you know, so, so hopefully it will never happen again. And, you know, that's why I think it's so important for, for them to keep the, keep it in the school, talk about places like CARP and the Cold War, Russia, the Berlin Wall. It's really important for the kids to know these days. So, because it happened a long time ago and if they don't learn about it in history or learn about you know, war to the Vietnam War or all that. It may it, it may happen again. So yeah, I, I think it's very important to remember all of that. You know, and teach the younger people today so they understand you know, learn by my mistakes kind of thing. I'm not talking about uh, yeah, I have two boys and a girl. Yeah. Um, they knew I worked here, um, and actually my daughter, her class, her history class, um, one day her class was given five questions to find the answers about uh, in reference to the bunker, and you know, she just came home and asked me the questions and I answered them. So she went to school the next day and she was the only one that had the answers to all the questions, and her teacher was... Hmm, how come Liz was able to find the answers and then not, nobody else? And they were like, well, because her mom used to work there. And so they were coming on a tour of the bunker. So her teacher had called me up and asked if I would come uh, with them and see what he was interested in was, you know, the tour says this was like that, this was like that. Did I agree? Was it like that when we worked there? And, you know, there was a couple of little differences, but Mostly everything was the way it was. They had this room wrong. They had a dentist room wrong. Like there was a, a, a dental, we didn't have a dental clinic here. Um, in the MIR, there was a dentist chair and that's where if a dentist used to come in once a week and um, that's where he did his thing. But it's somewhere here, you guys had a room uh, marked as a dental clinic. That was actually an ident room for the MPs. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there was a few things that were different. Um, and also the tour was like, well, here's Canada's vault. And if you stand in front of Canada's vault, the, the mirrors all, there's like, a, there's like a very narrow tunnel or hallway all around the vault. And you could see mirrors all around it. And they, you know, they were showing that. So you could always see that nobody's trying to drill through the wall or whatever. And it's like, yeah, did you know 57 laps around that, that around there is uh, a mile and a half? <laughs> because we used to have to do a mile and a half run test for physical training. And right in front of the vault was our gym. And, but yeah, apparently, I don't know if anybody actually ran it because I mean, it's like two feet wide, but 57 laps around the, the, the vault was a mile and a half. 
That's what I heard. I don't know if that's true or not, but everybody said that, yeah, 57 laps. <laughs> I don't think anybody could run that. I mean, it's like two feet wide. You'd be smacking into the walls all over the place. But yeah, that was that was one thing I said. I I know something about the 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 big vault, and they was, and also in the tour they said yes, this room was always kept empty, uh, in case Canada's money had to move. It was like oh, it was never empty when I was there. <laughs> it was always packed solid. It was a storage room. Uh, one time it was supply. It was always used for something. I mean, it's a big room, but it was always packed solid. You know, it was never empty. If Canada all of a sudden went to war and they had to move everybody in here, I don't know what they would have done because there was there was stuff everywhere. And then then we got a new CEO one uh, year. He was like, "Okay, everything's moving. Okay, rooms that were destined to be." Okay, the Prime Minister's office was being used by the CO. And he was like, okay, there will be nobody in the Prime Minister's office. Canada's vault will be empty. And he, like, all the rooms that were uh, destined for government were had to be vacated. And we could only use the rooms that was destined for the military. Which actually made more sense because if something ever happened, you know, everybody wouldn't have to be moving all their stuff all of a sudden, like moving offices and what have you. Uh, but yeah, that was a lot of work, you know, yeah, for everybody to move. And yeah, a lot of people gave up that. Well, most of the offices here are pretty basic, but like the CEO's office, it was the best office in the whole place, right? It was the prime minister's office, had a little bedroom and everything. But yeah, he came out of there and went down the hall like everybody else. So yeah, it was. Uh, he was probably the smartest man that ever got posted here when he started changing that all around. But um, yeah, nowhere I work had to move though. Yeah. yeah. No, it was it was a good place to work. Mm -hmm. It was everybody liked it here. Yeah. Yeah. What was your feeling walking back into it today? Oh, there's ghosts in here. <laughs> I'm sure there's ghosts in here. Like, it's just creepy. And it, you know what? It was creepy seeing all those kids out there because, I mean, when I was here, there had never been a child in here ever. And to see them just wandering around, I was like, okay, this is so should not be happening. Or like, I know I came on a tour once, and when I worked in OSAX, OSAX was very, very restricted. And to see people wandering around in that room just sense shivers up my spine and especially on the tour at, at the time that I took it you entered that room and it's like a it's got a false floor it's it's a raised room so you, we had stair we had a, an exit door it was an emergency exit door like you know because it was we had the hail on gas for the computers if ever there was a fire in there and so that was an emergency exit kind of thing because the big electronic doors would would shut you wouldn't be able to open them and I had never ever seen those doors open before and these are the doors we were entering the room and it's like first of all you gotta go through the female quarters to get there and you're going through that door that was always sealed and I was like okay this is just wrong <laughs> this shouldn't be happening <laughs> They should have everybody going in the door they're supposed to go in. But I mean, it was so restricted you to see all these people wandering around the room. Was, yeah, it's just wrong. <laughs> um, that's all the questions that I have. But do you have any, uh, you know, favorite stories that you like to tell? Or you have any? I, I probably do if I could remember any of them. <laughs> I, I know absolutely everybody loved it here. Like there was very, I don't know of anybody who didn't like it here, you know, because uh, it was just, we were all just a family because there wasn't a whole ton of us here. And, it, you know, we were all in very close quarters. So, yeah, everybody loved it. I mean it, everybody, it was the best posting I ever had. Everybody was so close. Everybody knew everybody. It was, it was a good place to work. Yeah, a lot of the offices people put, um, actually window frames up with curtains in it, like a scenery in it to make it look like you were outside. And I even painted a picture for somebody, uh, a big picture for somebody's, for somebody's office. 
to you know just to make it look like outside kind of thing. Well, that's a lot of people did that. They had their little window frame up to look, make it look like we were above ground. <laughs> it didn't really look like it, but you know, it fooled them. <laughs> Okay, so you mentioned the last time about uh, when you would do exercises in the bunker. And, yes. And those were the times when you stayed over in the yeah. bunker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, could you just talk about those times? Well, I mean, we'd usually get called in the middle of the night. You know, it was like a mock war sort of thing, like, oh, the bomb's going to hit. And uh, so we'd all rush out here in the middle of the night, you know, half asleep. And um, they had... A lot of the personnel, a lot of the day workers would get put on something called BDF, which is Base Defense Force, and they were like supposed to guard everybody, you know, and they would go out and they would guard CARP and their, you know, their guns and their rifles and everything. And then they had the, they called them the essential personnel. They were the ones that had to work, OSOX, FCC, the Message Center, that kind of stuff. And, and we worked 12, sh 12 hour shifts when we were on call out, the, you know, 12 on, 12 off. and we would, you know, sleep in the bedrooms and uh, I, you never, you'd wake up, you never knew if it was morning or night, you know, you'd see the clock and it's like, it's okay, is it eight in the morning or eight at night? Like, what time am I working again? And you had no idea what it was. So of course, none of the clocks back then had AM and PM on them, right? So you'd get up, you'd get dry, you'd go out and it's like, it's morning or night. Or you'd look at the mess or the serving breakfast or supper <laughs> because you never knew. Like there was nothing in the hole to tell you morning or night, you know, what time of day it is. Like you look at the clock, there's no AM or PM in, on the on most of the clocks. And uh, yeah, so it was different. And we were, we were usually here for a few days and, it, you know, all of us. So it was very crowded. For us, it was crowded. It was much different than when we were here to work. And like there was everybody eating all three meals. Whereas as a shift worker, usually there was only your shift down at the cafeteria eating. It was very unusual to go down there at supper and it's, there's nowhere to sit kind of thing. But it was it was fun. It was always fun, you know, because you got to see everybody and all the time. And of course, everybody's joking around. And, and I, you know, I know a few times there was some booze passed around and not supposed to be during an exercise, but I know there was. You asked Brenda about that. <laughs> she just told me a story in the car on the way up here and about one of the exercises where she got absolutely bombed. It's like, I don't know where I was. <laughs> I must have been working. But uh, yeah, they were, they were the, the exercises were interesting. Uh, they were long. You couldn't wait till they were over. Of course, you know what? If you were on a course or, or something, everything stopped. You couldn't go. I, I, I did get to go on a course. I was taking my, I was getting my pilot's license and we had a call out and I was going to miss a day of ground school. So I typed up a memo and it was, it was going to cost me $20 an hour to make up this course because I wasn't there for it. And uh, like I would have to take it by private instruction and they let me go. Nobody got let go, you know, during the call out. But. I don't know what what else I told you about. Uh, what about the sleeping arrangements? Where did you stay when you were? Uh, well, we had female quarters uh, on the 300 level. But during the call-outs, we were usually down on the 100 level. And that's nine to a room. So we would be nine in a room. And, and they could even do more than that because everybody worked 12 on 12 off. So you could actually do 18 in a room you know, trade off on the beds, on the bed space. And they're three tier bunk beds, right? So you can't even sit up. Like even the top one can't sit up all the way because you'd hit the ceiling. And you had little lights and a little shelf, you know, to put your clock or whatever. And, but yeah, for the call outs, we slept on in the 100 level. Yeah, we were never comfortable. The, the mattresses were okay, but three tier bunk beds, not comfy. You know, because you couldn't sit up. You could sit up part way, but then you'd smack your head on the bunk above you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was the 100 level the same level that the men were on? Uh, I don't remember. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think we were all, all on the 100 level. Unless you were an officer or senior NCO, they would put them on the 200 level. 
Yeah, but all us, you know, riffraff would be down on the 100 level. And just for the, the, the exercise, because if you had to stay overnight in the bunker for whatever reason, you, like for the women, we'd use the women's quarters on the 300 level, which is, you know, the bathroom's right there. And because staying on the 100 level, we had to go up to the three to go to the bathroom. So there was nowhere down there to go. It's just bedrooms. Like, I, other the, you know what? I don't even know where the male bathroom was. Like the big one. I have no idea where it is. It's not funny. It's not funny. <laughs> I go, I never went in there. Because the female washrooms, I mean, like, okay, you've been in there. And there must be 20 sinks and a lot of sinks, but only a couple of showers and a couple of toilets. So I never figured that one out. Because, I mean, there is a lot of sinks in that bathroom. Because it goes forever. But I don't know where the male one is. I don't know. It's probably on the 100 level. Don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Isn't that funny? I spent all that time here and I never knew where it was. Um, could you talk a little bit about what your first impressions of the bunker were when you arrived? You were posted here and then... Where in God's name have they sent me? <laughs> <laughs> the first couple of days, every time I came out, I had a big headache, which is, was very normal because the bunker worked on positive pressure. So that was what the airlock was for, because you would walk um, into the airlock, the air pressure would change, and once it changed, the indoor, the, the inner door would open. Um, and they did that because if there was some kind of nuclear war, uh, so nothing would get in, the air pressure was always positive, so it would push anything out, so nothing could come in, no radiation or anything. So, I mean, once you were inside, you didn't notice that the air pressure was much, much stronger. Um, but uh, when you came out, you know, the air pressure was different and it was and the brightness, you know, because you'd be in the hole and it's all artificial light. It's all, you know, fluorescent lighting and you'd come out, especially during the summer. In the winter, we'd come out, it would be dark already. But in the summer, you come out and it's like, oh, and it, and it hurt your eyes. And for the first few days, everybody has a headache when they get out. And I think that was half of was the air pressure and half was the, the brightness, the shock of the brightness when you come out of the hole. It's, it's very shocking uh, if you're, you know, doing it every day, you've never done it before. And, and so I think it was half and half, the brightness and the air pressure, because the air pressure is much stronger in the hole uh, than it was outside. Um, oh, you mentioned last time, uh, how was the security getting in and out of the bunker every day? Oh, it was very tight. Um, nobody got in <laughs> that, that weren't allowed. You had to get through the MP shock first, um, before they'd open the gate. You had, get, you'd have, you had to go through the gate to get in. You had to go through the MP shock. Now, when I first got posted here, the MP shock was manned by the military police. Um, after a few years, um, it became commissioners that were in there and the MPs were on the inside. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there's cameras at the door. They didn't recognize you. They're not letting you in. And like they, they would, an intercom, they would talk to you, I guess, you know, like, who are you? What do you want? And if you weren't being posted there or something, they wouldn't let you in. You would just, you know, get bored and get out. Because they did have a few people try to sneak in. Um, I remember specifically working one night and somebody from the town of Carp had always bugged him that this place was here and for, you know, for so long and he had never seen it. He didn't know what it was or what they, you know, what we did here. And on his birthday one year, he got hammered and decided, I'm getting in there tonight. And he snuck in the back of the hole by the mess and came down, which, you know, the back of it wasn't manned. And he snuck down and came right up to the uh, airlock and, oh, I want to get in there. Yeah, they didn't let him in. <laughs> but he was determined, yes, this is the night it's going to happen. And uh, yeah, I guess he tried, well, so what do you do, right? You just don't, look, you just don't open the door. <laughs> He's like, sorry, you're not coming in. But everybody had, depending on where you were, you had access to, um, everybody had a different colored pass. And as soon as you walked in the door, um, they would give you your pass. 
and each pass would tell people if you were allowed in this area or not. Like, I think if you weren't allowed anywhere, your pass was blue. Um, if you were allowed, you know, here or there it was some other color. If you were allowed everywhere, it was red. Mine was red, so uh, red, I know, was you were allowed everywhere. Um, and every sensitive room also had an access list. Like, it was need to know, right? If you don't need to be in here, you're not coming in. And uh, I mean, you might have somebody who's got a red pass. However, if they're not on the access list, it's because they don't need to be in there. Not, and then they're not coming in. And they don't have the combination and you're not going to let them in either. So the security was very tight. Very, very tight. And like all the sensitive rooms were key lock pads. Like they were like a box and you stuck your hand in the box did your combination and it was done so that the person standing next to you couldn't see what combination you were doing. And if you look in at the comm center, the, the not the one that says message center, the actual place that the message center was, you'll see a hole in the wall and that's where the key box used to be. Because I, when I was here in June, the hole is still there where they ripped it out. And I'm sure it's probably still outside of Osax. Mm -hmm. yeah. You also talked a bit about the Winter Carnival last time and the Parliament Hill run. Oh, Just yeah. Describe your, your I was just telling somebody that a couple of days ago. Yes, somebody came up with the bright idea that, I think it was uh, Captain Pryor, uh, came up with the bright idea that we should, for our Winter Carnival, to open our Winter Carnival, we should have a torch, just like the Olympics. So they made this torch out of, I don't know what it was made out of, but it was filled with kerosene with a rag sticking out of the top that they lit on Parliament Hill. And I'm telling you, this thing stunk because of the kerosene burning. It was, and it was black. So it was awful. I can't believe we did that. And we ran in relays from Parliament Hill all the way to the bunker. I, I, and I, I don't know how I got sucked into doing that but, because it was a lot of freaking running and I wasn't a runner. I used to run only to do my mile and a half PT test once a year. Anybody can run a mile and a half if they have to, you know? And uh, yeah, I got sucked into doing it. And and you had to hold this thing with this burning kerosene rag in your face. Yeah. It was awful. It was just, it was awful. I, I cannot believe I got sucked into doing that. And then we finally get here and I was like, we're dead. Like it's a long run. Like it's really, really far. And the next morning, like my alarm went, I was coming out early because it was winter carnival and it's fun. And, and I used to set my alarm on the other side of my bedroom in the barracks. And so I had to get up and it went off and I jumped out of bed. I was like, oh God, I thought I was going to die. Every muscle in my body was tight and I hurt. I, just, I couldn't believe it. I, I was like getting across my alarm, like, oh, oh, oh. It was, it was horrible. And then get out here for the carnival and everybody who did the run was like walking like that, all bent and, and like, that was really, I'm really sore. I know I don't want to play any of these games today. I'll do them tomorrow. Because it was long. That is a long way. Because we went down, how did we do it? We went down. Well, apparently the buildings are on Rideau Street. We came, we probably went Rideau to Bank to maybe Bronson because we came down Carling. We ran all the way down Carling to March Road and from March Road and Carling out here, like all the way down March Road till we got to Carp Road. And oh my God, it was just, so, I can't believe we did that. Like how stupid were we? <laughs> <laughs> we obviously didn't know how to say no. <laughs> um, so this was another of my favorites of the summer. Um, the toads in the blast tunnel. Oh my God. I was just telling those guys about that too. I said, you remember the toads? It's, and they're like, well, Joe remembers the toads. Brenda doesn't remember. It might've been before Brenda's time. Um, we always had toads in the tunnel at night. Always, always, always. But there was some years but the worst than others. And it was one particular year that was disgusting. And it was the worst was at night, right? Because I guess they come out when it's dark and you'd go down. And of course the, the tunnel is lit, right? Not very well, but it's lit. And you'd be coming down the tunnel and all you can see is hop, 
everywhere. They're hopping everywhere. And there were so many, to you, you couldn't help but be stepping on them with your, and we're wearing big steel toe boots. Like, <coughs> it's disgusting. You get in there and your toe, your, your boots are full of goo from stepping on all that. You had no choice but to step on them because they're everywhere, right? Oh my God, it was just awful. And all you could see is them hopping everywhere. Like, they're coming, they're coming, they're going to step on us. And, yep. But this is... Oh, it's so gross. <laughs> yeah, there, that was disgusting. And it was every year we had toads down there. Brenda doesn't remember toads. But it was every year we had toads. But it was one or two years it was really bad. And like really, really bad. You can see the tunnel. It like if you go out there right now, it's the tunnel is damp, right? It's always damp. Um, but when you go through it on a hot, humid night, it's actually almost raining in there, right? You could see it coming down the sides, like dripping down the sides, and it would drip on your head. So it was so damp and so stinky because of the dampness that the toads were attracted to it at night. So that's why there was like a million toads in there because they would just they would just gra gravitate to, to, to the um, to the tunnel because it was moist, it was wet. And I know where they were all coming from. There used to be a swamp back there. And I'm sure that's where they were all coming from. And they would just, yeah, at night, it was like, well, we have to close the tunnel now. We all need to get squished. <laughs> it was disgusting. Uh, oh, could you talk a little bit about um, the dynamic between the, the men and the women in the bunker? Because the women were in minority yeah we were there was far far less women than there was uh males but you know that's one thing about the canadian military is that males and female males are pretty much the same they get paid the same you know you do you do the job you you're the rank you get paid the same as the males and you don't at that back when i was here you didn't see that too often where males and females got paid the same for the same job often a female will get paid far less and uh, and which really shocked me, right? Because it's never happened to me because I joined when I was young. I'd hear stories about that. So, what do you mean you do the same job as a guy, but you get paid $10,000 a year less? Like, how can that be? But in the Canadian military, that does not happen. And um, so here, really, I mean, you know, they had the old no fraternization thing going on, which is normal. But... There was really no big deal between males and females in here. Like, I never had a problem. I've never heard of anybody having a problem here. Um, you know, we were all, we were all like one big family in here. Because, you know, it, it, it was like a building, but it was like a small, close-knit building. And everybody knew each other. Every, there was nobody in here that you really didn't like. Everybody was friends, you know, and we spent time away from here um, together as well. Like I know our my whole shift, at least once a month, we would get together and all go out to dinner or somebody would have a house party. And so we liked each other outside of work as well because CARP was a, I guess there was about a hundred people here and we everybody knew everybody. As a matter of fact, with the breakfast <laughs> this morning, um, like we're all excommunicators at this breakfast. And of course, Brenda brings out these books. So we're looking at all the names and laughing and everything. Well, you know, we were all, everybody we were eating with today was here during the Denis Lorte uh, incident. And so we come across his name in one of the books and it's like, yeah, how come he never comes out to the breakfast? <laughs> yeah, because we'd all shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, we, we were all friends. I, I, there was no, there was no big thing between male and females here, except you know we had separate quarters or we had separate bathrooms. Uh, uh, but there was no big deal between the males and the females here. Like there really wasn't. And 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 a lot of that I think it's because the military does not uh, separate male and female like in anything you, in jobs pain, anything like that. So the dynamic was perfect. Like you couldn't have asked for anything better. And I think Brenda will tell you the exact same thing. Yeah. You know, because I don't think anybody had a problem here. Um, last time you talked a little bit about the Lordy case, but also people 
um, talking to your family about psychological problems oh, you yeah. have had. Yeah. What was was that like a general assumption? And what was it? It was after the uh, right after the Dini Lorte thing happened, um, like the day it happened. I was working the day it happened. And I lived in barracks in Ottawa, and like we were all so shocked. I mean, everybody knew Denis, and we were all so, so, so shocked at what happened. And like when we left the hall, I mean, the, the MPs were in bulletproof vests, and which is common now, but it wasn't back then. There was reporters everywhere, and like you know, to get out of the combat, we had to like fight to get out because of the reporters, and we were. Um, which probably to take that off too. I'm banging it. Um, we used to take a shuttle run from the, the single people. We would take a shuttle run from here back into Uplands, and because we lived in barracks there, and we were also shocked. We got off the shuttle run and went directly into the mess. Like we all just wanted to go and have a beer, and just think about what happened that day. And there was, of course, it affected everybody in the military especially in Ottawa, everybody was so shocked. And when we went into the mass, it was, I think it was a Monday, and, and there was a lot of people in the mass, which normally on a Monday, there isn't. And we went in, and of course, we were all wearing this big carp crest on our uniform, right? We walked into the mass, and it was dead silence. It was like, you could hear a pin drop, like, oh my God, they're here. Like, are they gonna start shooting us? Or like, oh my God, like, okay, we were here yesterday. You know, were you afraid of us? But they all thought we were nuts. Like we lived in 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 barracks, so they could you know big washrooms, and we all shared the bathrooms. And the other girls didn't want to even be on our side, right? They were like, "No, well, we'll use these things, right?" Like, what did you think we were going to do? You know, we are not. We're the same people we were yesterday. And my brother um was the president of a fraternity in in mcgill university and once every sunday they had a big dinner all together you know great big long table all this anyways the topic of the next dinner was what happened at the quebec assembly with denis lorte and they, there was the big conversation going on about it my brother kept quiet about it but people started saying uh, at the table, you know, anybody who works underground for uh, a length of time like that has to have psychological psychological problems and, you know, mental problems from working there. And, and they were going on and on and on and on and on about it. And finally, my brother stood up and he was like, you know what? Shut the hell up. You know, my sister works there and she's just fine. But, well, one of the guys I worked with, his name was Ken Cossaboon. He was a calm research. Um, he used to belong to some kind of group and, uh, the next time he met with the group, as soon as he walked out and I think it was a joke, but it really hurt his feelings. As soon as he walked in the room, they were like, hit the deck, you know, and they all dropped, right? Because Ken walked into the room from carp <laughs> and it, but you know what? It might've been funny to them, but it really hurt Ken's feelings, right? I, and it's like, we we're not nuts. You know, and a matter of fact, you walked into most of the offices and they had little frames made to, you know, with curtains to look like windows. Look kind of looked like we were up above ground, <laughs> you know, we weren't, but we weren't nuts. There was nothing wrong with any of us, you know, maybe there was, we're all back. <laughs> but yeah, the assumption was we were all crazy and we all had psychological problems because we were working underground. And it was so not true. Denny had problems long before any of this happened, you know, and it was his problems and nobody else's. So, but the assumption was, yes, we were on that. I mean, even like far away from the military, my brother's fraternity, he didn't even tell them I worked here until they all started saying we were all crazy. And he was like, okay, they're not, okay? My sister works there. And uh, he was really offended that they were, you know, all putting down anybody who could possibly work in CARP, that they should all be psychologically tested before they get in there and, and when they're finished and they, they get out. And I was like, okay, you know what? It's just a building. It, it happens to be underground, but it's still just a building. You know, it is a building with a different purpose, but it is still just a building. Yeah, yeah, and everybody thought we were nuts. Um, 
I know we were treated different in the barracks, like for a long time. So the morale and carp was really low after that, okay, for quite some time. After the whole Denis thing happened. Uh, just uh, one more thing, actually. Um, uh, did you and the other people who worked here ever talk about the purpose of this building and the possibility of a nuclear attack? Or... We, used to, we used to joke about it, saying that, yeah, I would say, you know, if it, if it shut down because of a nuclear attack, most of us were saying, yeah, we're getting out before it shuts down, right? Because there'll be nothing left. Uh, you know, you come out after, I mean, how long would you have to stay in the hole? after a nuclear attack, a very, very long time, and you come out and there's nothing there, did we really want that kind of a life? No, we'd rather be on the outside and have it over with. Or, you know, I mean, there, this place was, what, geared for something like 550 people to stay here? That's a lot of people in here. And you know what, there'd be a lot of problems, I think, in such close quarters. I think there'd be an awful lot of fighting and I think there'd be a little bit more than fighting too. And I don't think anybody really wanted to be here. If it actually happened, which you know, we figured it probably never would. And we, yeah, we did talk about it, but you know, most of us were here for a very different reason. So it really didn't fit on us a whole lot, the purpose that CARP was built, because we were not really here for that. Yeah, we were here for totally different things. So, yeah, the whole idea of the nuclear thing didn't really touch us much. You know, not at all, actually. It didn't touch me anyways, right? You no, know, it was never a topic of conversation. You know, the operators were here for a reason, and, and it wasn't nuclear war. And most everybody else here was here to support the operators. So, yeah. Great. Um, do you have anything else that you wanted to talk about either? No, I don't think so. I'm sure you're going to get an ear from Brenda. She's very keen on this. Like, I mean, like I said, she started to cry in the parking lot. She was so excited to be here. And she actually wants to come back before she heads back to Vancouver, just to wander around some more. She's, you know what, both Brenda and I was our first posting. And the, the three of us were standing at the beginning of the tunnel talking to some people who had just left. And we, all three of us said this was our best posting in our entire careers. And I think a lot of people that were posted here see it the same. You know, it was their best posting. First of all, it was very interesting. It was very different. But it was the close-knit community of all of us in here. You know, like everybody knew everybody. It was very close-knit. And uh, yeah, I think I think most people will say this was their best posting, and 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 Brenda's been posted to Bermuda and the and in Yellowknife, so she's had some pretty exotic postings, and she still says this was her best. Mm -hmm.